So what we're going to do next, our last session before we go into our breakouts, is we're going to bring back all of our national speakers, and we're going to have a short conversation moderated by Superintendent Baszler and myself to pick up on the major learnings from today, ask any follow-up questions, uh, and, and really try to have a, a holistic uh, conversation between all of the wonderful speakers who presented their unique and individual ideas today. For those of you who are, who are watching online, we've had a uh, very strong participation on the live stream. Feel free to tweet in any questions at hashtag NDInnovativeEd, uh, and we will have microphones available on the sides for anyone who would like to ask a question of our distinguished panelists. So let's uh, bring them all back out here with a round of applause. <laughs> so, you know, the, the whole purpose of today has been talking about innovative education, and, and I, I remember being a social studies teacher, the feeling of sitting in some professional development of this too shall pass, or this, you know, what is the next secret sauce? I mean, my question for you is, is what I have heard today is that there is, is no one thing. I mean, it, it, how, how, do we, how do we cement that and how do we build that momentum? It's not as tangible, right, but it's, it's so vitally important to recognize the, the unique nature of each school district. How do, how do we share that and how do we build that, that common understanding with, with schools across the state? So, so I, I would say there is a secret sauce. So, I, but, but, but here's the difference. I don't think that there is an identical vision for every school or district. I think everybody's gonna be able to. But I think the biggest mistake that people make is they can f make the changes and create the transformation without changing the culture. And so if, if I hear a, uh, and it'll be interesting if the rest of the panel would agree with that, but if I, as I think about the movie and as I think about the work on hacks and I think about the success of the districts that are in our Ed Leader 21 net network, you got to fix the culture first, and if you try to push the change on a culture that doesn't want to embrace it, it won't happen. So I, so that's what I, I think the secret sauce is the culture. I don't think all the cultures are identical, mm -hmm. and I think each lead, set of leaders got to figure out how to take the culture where it is and move it, but you can't create a transformation, continuous improvement culture if you continue to have a group of adult professionals who just say, it's pretty good the way it is, and I'm not sure why we're changing it. Great. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> not on the record. <laughs> I concur wholeheartedly, and the only thing I would add is the desired end state, I think that we all want, is that every student has the opportunity for success, that we do not cast upon some certain groups of students. I think there, in some communities there's an epidemic of low expectations and we need to cast that out. So the culture, I would 100% agree, but I think the guiding principle is we all agree the desired end state that all students have the opportunity. And I'll just add, have the opportunity to do meaningful work. Yeah, I mean, I think we know at some level what works. I mean, when kids have a sense of purpose when it's connected to the real world, they're developing essential competencies, they have agency, their knowledge is deep and retained. How you get there, that's where the creativity comes in and that's where things are great. I wanna take on this, this is a little bit off the topic, but the topic of charter schools has come up a few times today. Uh, if you'd back me up three years ago, four years ago, I'd say a state that didn't have charter schools might be at a disadvantage. After traveling last year to all 50 states, it's the biggest advantage you have. And, and the reason I say that is that in so many states, there are just such divisive issues around charter and public schools that it just tears things apart. And the entire discussion is which one has a slight upper hand in this Hunger Games of test scores. And, and we think of charter schools as somehow being a different type of education. And, and my film's about a charter school, so there are some great charter schools, but most of those are just grind out better test score types of places that most of us would not want our kids. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So at, in my welcome today, I charged all of us with learning together. 
and bringing something new to our understanding of what this education journey is all about. So my question to you is, um, what has been your biggest learning today from either those that were on your panel, other speakers, or anything else that you've seen or heard today from those of us in North Dakota? I'll jump in. Um, I've been thrilled to be here. As I said before, it was my first time here. So I'm very much struck by the vibrancy of the innovation landscape from full-scale projects like Western Cass. Did I get that right? Northern Cass. Northern Cass, <laughs> sorry. Uh, from Northern Cass to a real sense that I felt like came through on a number of panels, and especially mine because we were kind of focused on it, but that sense of a willingness to step into some of the unknown and to do that with a real uh, dedication to students and their needs and to looking to understand that in each place. So I feel that that, that, um, that empathic approach to design and change is, is really critical and I felt that in many ways here today. The policy environment that you and the governor have created along with your, your partners in the legislature I think clear the path for you to, to have real meaningful outcomes here. And we're excited to be a part of the deployment in that world, but, but uh, getting a, a state that has the policy and the programs, getting it right, is, it sets you up for great success. That's great. So, so let me ask to build off that a little bit. What, what excites you most about this work, the work that you do? You all have four very diverse backgrounds, right? What led you, what led you to this stage today? Thinking about what you've seen, where you see the, the country going, where you see the, the state going, what, what, what excites you? Well, I mean, in my comments, I said, I mean, North Dakota cannot just affect the lives of 100,000 students here. I right. think you can send an enormous signal to the rest of the country and around the world. And that, to me, is what's exciting. And when I meet with people, the people here are just so nice and responsible. I mean, it's just like I pinch myself and say, why did I ever live in Boston? Um, <laughs> and, you know, but, but, but you find people, you know, there are people here with business backgrounds. So higher ed is represented here today. Teachers are here, parents are here, students are here. They, nobody had to be here. They're all here because they care. And so, so every time I come, I just get that much more conviction that this state has enormous opportunities to do something unprecedented. Yeah. yeah. I get excited about making things better. Uh, and, I, and, and we get to do that in communities large and small all over the country and we get to see it in the success of the students. And I'm excited about our work together that Superintendent Basler and I plotted out in, uh, in, in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, long ago, and, and seeing it to fruition. So I'm excited. I, I didn't really understand uh, the policy situation that the new bill created until I got here. And so I, I want to put this in a historical context for me. When we founded the Partnership for 21st Century Skills in 2002, it was at the same, almost the same moment that NCLB was starting. And the people said, well, why would you start this at the beginning of NCLB? And I said, we said at the time, because NCLB, by definition, is getting the metric wrong because it's starting accountability with whatever metrics are lying around and it's gonna start staking snapshots, and what we wanna do is at some point, somebody's gonna wake up and say, we've been using this, the metrics of the last 30 years and we've been holding people accountable to the old system instead of the new system. So when I heard the panel this morning, I thought of it in that context, which is what you guys have done, and I've never seen state legislators take this position before, ever, is they basically said, we need to let educators um, innovate. We need to let educators innovate, and we need their oh, help. Right there. Yeah, we need yeah, to yeah. let the educators, <laughs> educators innovate. innovate. I thought I, I, that's how I felt. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> these, guys, these guys are too tired. They don't understand what happened. This is so, big, people. It was a big deal. Um, but but I think what they've done is they put the onus back on the educators to say, you guys have actually during this period of innovation let us know what 21st century accountability is gonna look like. So that to me is incredibly exciting and that's actually the model that's got, got to get replicated around the country. 
which is we, we're going to have accountability in education. It just needs to be 21st century accountability. And what you're doing right is you're putting the onus on the education community to say, we're giving you this chance. We're going to try to, to lessen regulation. We're going to give you the opportunity to innovate. And you've got to be partners in figuring out what that new accountability system looks like. That is an extraordinary opportunity. And, and, and I, I really do look at it where we're sitting here 15 years later, um, and this is the beginning of people around the country. I agree with Ted. I think once people see what you're doing, um, not all of them will get it right, because not all, all, not all states are inclined to do this rationally. Um, in fact, they're, they're committed to doing it irrationally. <laughs> but, um, but there will be other states to follow your lead, and I think it's very exciting to be here at the beginning of your journey. So there are skeptics out there. There are naysayers that are uh, consider what we're talking about today is you know, a scriptless, you know, hither nither way of teaching our students, and may consider it fluff, and are very committed to our, our students need you know back to the three R's and the foundations, and we're moving away from that. So. Um, how, how do we respond to that, and, and do we really believe that this is something that everyone in North Dakota can get on board with? And, and how do we, when I am truly committed to that, and I know we will get this done in North Dakota, but how do we help those skeptics understand and, and support us along this journey? Well, you know, one of the reasons that we made the film we made was we immersed the audience in kids working on an interdisciplinary project-based challenge. And if you say it in words or you write about it, most people think of it as summer camp. You know, it's easy to be dismissive. There are, there are naysayers everywhere. And when you think of that kind of work as summer camp, then you say, why are we doing that? But when you follow those kids in the film, no one at the end of the film thinks of it the same way anymore. They all say, this is an example. This shows me what these kids are capable of. And, I don't know if you've seen the film, but these kids just won't give up on it because they care so much about it. And so to me, it's making it really visible, tangible, and emotional. And, and really, it was the logic behind doing a film is that words don't change people's mind, emotions do. But at the end of the day, I, I would say, how much are you willing to push back on naysayers when the future of all these kids is on the line? Right? And, and there will always be naysayers. I mean, people love to be grumpy. It's just the way it works in the world. And, you know, but, it, but you have to say, what is going to give my kid, these kids we care so much about, the best chance in life? And I guarantee you, it's not memorizing a bunch of stuff in advance of a test. It's learning how to work with other people to solve problems that make a difference to the world and develop their skills and confidence that they can do it. So, so I, I hearken back to the beginning of the day. I forget the, our principal's name I hear the principal of... Tom. Tom, is Tom still here? He did. He, there you are. 24/7. He did. He did. He, he did a. He did, he, did, he did a fabulous job. And what he said was, um, and this is why this isn't fluff. What he said was that the change, the profound change we made is, is that we took away all the individual offices. We told people that the new culture is a culture of collaboration. And then he said, if the one thing that, that they wouldn't ask back for or wouldn't tolerate is to return to a non-collaborative environment. I was thinking as he said it, he's really describing the culture of the 21st century workforce. What he's described as 21st century companies, 21st century, that, that is the work. And so if you go to the great cutting edge companies and, and the governor was uh, active in one of them, the high school here has designed itself in a way that's a replica of, or at least a parallel to, those kinds of companies. And so it isn't fluff. It is the way that progress gets made in the 21st century. And I think over time what people will say is that the teachers and the schools in North Dakota that mm -hmm. don't want to make that transition are just putting off the inevitable because that's the work environment in which their kids are going to be. And so I, I, I don't think, you know, I, you can look at this high school as a, a one-off aberration experiment, but I don't think about it that way. I think about it as actually modeling 20, the 21st century workforce, 21st century government, 21st century decision-making of all kinds. And in that con in context, it's a profound example. It's not a piece of fluff. 
Great. So, so in moving to that inevitability, there, there are obviously roadblocks along the way. You've all traveled the country. You've seen some places that are, that are further ahead than others. What are some of those roadblocks? How can we identify them? And, and what encouragement can we give to educators to try to traverse them? The number one thing that holds back the opportunities that we bring to a community are educator or district and building leader biases. Um, the, as I said before, the epidemic of low expectations and casting aside whole swaths of students or being more concerned about how things will look for them. Mm -hmm. uh, being held accountable sometimes doesn't feel so good. And, uh, but being able to say this is the right work to do and even if sometimes we're gonna take it on the chin, we're gonna keep pressing forward for, for the kids. Um, I call it adults behaving badly. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we've had to turn down school sites that were fully funded because the culture simply was not conducive to allowing for all students to succeed. Yeah, I think we've mentioned it a couple times during the day, but um, and it's also related to adult culture is we really do need more opportunities for all educators and adults working to build these cultures and within the system to have opportunities to learn in these ways, right? To collaborate the way teachers here collaborate, to actually solve some of the critical challenges together and to have their own immersive project-based deeper learning experiences um, because it's not where everyone came from. And so building that in and ensuring that the ongoing adult learning is really a part of whatever we're creating, I think is, it's not the world's biggest roadblock, but it's definitely something to be aware of. Do you want to talk about college or do you want me to? Oh, roadblock? Yeah. Oh, and then, well, if you talk about it as roadblock and then I'll follow. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we're, we're lucky to have higher, higher ed here, but, but I would start right at college admissions. And, and if you look at what we want kids to be good at in high school, and you look at what gets put in a college application, I think they have very little overlap. And, and I think as a result, I mean, there's a, I just posted something last, last week of how many people have done incredibly well in life that just, school doesn't work for them. And so if in fact we modernize college admissions, if in fact we modernize a high school transcript, if those reflect kids able to identify and make progress on important problems, with an increasing level of accomplishment and proficiency. And that's get valued in college applications and that gets valued in the high school transcript. Because I can tell you, it's now being valued by employers. So in, my, in our film, we show Laszlo Bach, Google. He ran all of people operations for Google. So for years, Google just hired by SAT, grade point average, pedigree of the college. He did the work to see whether it actually made any difference. It was uncorrelated. They now ask kids, tell me about really difficult problems you've had to persevere, fail multiple times, and ultimately come up with something that shows progress. Same thing with the Naval Academy, and I think the chancellors here, their admissions process has been entirely rethought to value kids that overcome adversity. My software companies, they used to hire based on which college they went to. Now they look at authentic examples of code. That's happening in the world, and it needs to happen in college admissions. So can I comment on what, so one of the hopeful things that happened today during lunch is that, I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> He's good at that. Yeah, I am, that's my job. Um, a few people from the University of North Dakota came up to me and said, what is it that they could do in response to the conference that would be helpful? And I, I, I told them what Ted just said, which is, you know, one of the easiest excuses, and this is a hurdle question, one of the easiest excuses that, that, that districts and, and communities have is that the parents will go, is that what colleges are looking for? So if you really wanted to have a huge breakthrough in North Dakota, take the energy of the morning and allow, let's say, a year or two years for everybody, every district to work on their profile of a graduate. Figure out what the, what the common pieces of that profile of a graduate are and get an agreement from the University of North Dakota to send a signal to every district in North Dakota and say that the profile of a graduate that most districts are working on in North Dakota is the admissions requirements for the University of North Dakota and other, you know, you have other universities that could adopt it and send the signal. We are interested in a student portfolio that gives evidence of collaboration, communication, creativity, and creative problem solving. 
And that sends a signal to every school board, every superintendent, every parent that the competencies that we've been talking about all day, and, and by the way, I think it's important to have the business community involved in that, the, both the K-12 and the higher ed conversation. That sends an incredible signal to everybody saying, we're actually gonna get K-12 and, and higher ed aligned in a way that it, I, I will tell you this, you would be the first university system that would have articulated the profile of a graduate as university requirements, and it will, it will help the university, but it will have huge helpful uh, implications for the communities of North Dakota when that signal gets sent. During today's uh, panelist discussion, you've seen you've, and heard and heard from and amazing business and education leaders, some incredible teachers, legislators, and students. What are you seeing, though, that we're missing? What is our untapped opportunity that you believe we need to cultivate and nurture that we don't have and you've seen an absence of in North Dakota so we can continue to grow? That's be a good question. Nice job, Kirsten. Is there a phone a friend option? Uh, <laughs> you've got state leadership. You've got a policy environment. You've got a very engaged group of stakeholders who want to make changes for the right reasons. Uh, I think the only thing that's missing is punching cookies, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> no excuses here. I'll ask a question, because for me it is a question. I mean, we have a great group of educators here today. I'm curious about the teacher pipeline and how you think about that, because I, uh, sometimes that is a real barrier and a roadblock. And, I think for the kind of innovation that we're talking about and the intersection of education with the real world and with the business community as we've been talking about, thinking about non-traditional teachers mm -hmm. as part of that and thinking about teachers that when they switch to project-based learning aren't supposed to spend all night long grading all of those projects, right? That there, there are some things to really think about of how we innovate the rules and the rituals mm -hmm. and the use of time around that that could be very beneficial. I just, I don't know exactly where you guys are with that, but that's quite intriguing to me. So, so I, I would say that our visceral response was the right response, which you really don't have anything missing. I think that what's gonna be critical though um, is patience. And I thought that the legislator who said, one of the legislators said, um, this is not a quick process and we shouldn't be, the biggest mistake you could make is for the legislature to turn around in 24 months and say to you, give me the data, right? This is an innovation period that's gonna create, five, be five to 10 years, probably call it a decade. Um, and I think it'd be extraordinary if you followed through in that spirit and gave the educators the decade they need to do this. Um, and so if you, if you double back on that and all of a sudden say, in very short terms, there aren't the concrete results we want, mm -hmm. then I think you're, you're gonna undercut, you're gonna undercut the effort. So the question for me would be, um, you have all the basic assets you need, you certainly have the attitudes and the approaches you need, can you maintain the spirit and culture that's in the room? And then I guess the other thing I should just say is people in the room, that have been in the room today and the ones that didn't make it today really have to jump at the opportunity. And I guess I, what I want to say to all you, I haven't been to all 50 states, but we have districts now in 32 states. You're in a very lucky situation right now. And I don't know of any other state that's been given the opportunity that I've heard you've been given. So if I were in your shoes, I think I'd jump at this really hard because um, there, there's almost no other state in the country that's been given the opportunity that you've been given. Well, let's... Let's give a hand to our educators. I mean, that's really why we're here right now today. So while, while we're all up, I want to jump to a, a question from Twitter. Uh, please keep them coming in, uh, as we still have a couple minutes left in the panel. Uh, I've, I've got a, a question from Kyler. How do, you, how do you challenge your high flyers? How do you use just the vast swaths of, of technological resources out there, Khan Academy, Genius Hour? How do you structure that in a way that promotes excellence 
for, for our students, both on the high achieving end of the spectrum uh, and those who might need a little additional assistance. Well, there's no better challenge for all students, but high flyers as well, to take on the most rigorous courses. The resources that are available at all times and without limitations are unprecedented within recent years, and it really will help, it certainly helps aid our educators in terms of the, the differentiation, because one of the challenges we, we encourage our schools to take on is digging deeper into the bench, that it's not just the 5% or the 10% that are taking on these rigorous courses, mm -hmm. but the 20, 25, 30, 50%, and they're gonna require those resources to, to maintain pace. I, I always have a great deal of hesitation over phrases like high flyers or gifted, because traditional school measures people on this very narrow dimension largely based on memorization, and we don't even have the courtesy to teach kids memorization techniques. <laughs> and and so, so there are an awful lot of kids getting a message that they're high flyers that actually are gonna struggle like crazy when they get out into the real world. And there are a lot of kids that get told daily that they're not that proficient. You know, it's one SAT word that kids that are in tough circumstances always know is proficient, because they're told in every conference with teachers that they're not. And, and the reality is, if you give them something they care about, I hear this over and over and over again from adults, it's amazing. If a kid's interested in something, they can become an expert in a matter of days. And I say, doesn't that have profound implications for what we should be doing in school? Why aren't we finding the things that kids are interested in and fanning that passion and flames? And I think that's the role teachers can play. And so whatever these resources, there are a myriad of resources. Chris, our student who's doing the smartphone app to help them find them, there are lots of ways kids can get at it that don't require reading a textbook. I mean, there are a lot of kids that learn better visually. You know, and, and how many kids learn how to do something now by watching a three-minute YouTube instead of having to read instruction manuals written by somebody who learned English a year ago and lives in Taiwan or something? And, and so <laughs> you, you look at that and you say, there are a myriad of ways kids can learn. Right. Why don't we respect that and start evaluating kids on the end result of what they can produce, what they can create, and what impact they can have on their world? And I think if we start to think about it that way, we realize, you know, I, I mean, I, I'll go a little bit off, off the reservation. I'm on, in theory, uh, I, I am, on the Khan Academy Thought Leadership Council. And I have this running battle with Sal Khan, so bear with me on this. But I say, Sal, I don't get it. You know, you have you know, thousands of lectures teaching kids how to do things by hand on an iPad that does it instantly and error-free. You know, like, <laughs> This makes no sense to me. Why are kids spending nine months in high school calculus learning the mechanics of integrals by hand? And trust me, I have published papers from back in the day when you couldn't do it computationally. But I've spent the last two and a half years of my life trying to find one adult in America who does integrals and derivatives by hand in their daily life. They are not at Boeing, they're not 3D solid modeling companies, they're not anywhere. Right. And so Sal, I said, you have 300 lectures teaching kids how to do this by hand. Why don't you have a lecture or two or maybe even three on how to use math to solve a real problem? So, so I, I'm going to answer, answer. Go ahead, go off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to answer this in, in, a, in a slightly different but related way. Um, one of my high moments was that I was invited by High Tech High to actually come and meet with their faculty of 35. And I thought, oh my goodness, these are the 35 best teachers in America. And I said to the principal, what do you want me to do? And they said, I want you to explain to them where this high school is gonna be in 10 to 15 years. I said, oh, I can do that. They said, you can? He says, what are you gonna tell them? I said, they are gonna be working on solving the problems of San Diego, California, the United States, and the world much more frontally and conspicuously than they are now. And he goes, well, some of the teachers won't like that because the premise of that school is you work on teacher and student passion. And so focusing on, but, but here's what I want to say. If, if, when you say to me, I, I understood your thing uh, differently. When you say, how do we challenge our high flyers? I thought you meant everybody. Um, so the answer back is have them working on solving the problems of North Dakota have them working on solving the problems of North Dakota. I got invited to, a, a, a because of my connection to, to Montana, I got invited to a conference in Montana. And in order to, to help them, and I'll do this here at some point if you want me to, 
I had my friend in Helena call six institutions in Montana and ask, in Helena, and ask them what would they do if they had 10 to 15 students for, the, for senior year? How would they put them to work as students? And there were some great examples. The museum was going to have them curate an exhibit. But the, the amazing one was the FAA had just lost its planning staff and said that it would take 10 to 15 seniors and put them to work on creating a 10-year transfer pl transformation, uh, transformation plan for air traffic in central Montana. Now, when I tell that story, people go, did they actually do it? Because we don't want to go back to Helen. <laughs> we don't want to fly to <laughs> Stay in North Dakota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's a good reason. But, but I, I think that where you ought to be headed as a, as a state culture is to have students at all levels working on solving the problems of their communities and of their state. Um, and, and, uh, and that's how I would think about that question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any more so we've still got a couple minutes. We want to open it up to questions here in the audience. We've got a couple microphones uh, located on the side there. Any questions from folks out in the audience that we can engage with? I'm Mark Hagaroff, the chance to be referred to. I just want to thank Superintendent Baszler for including us in this wonderful event. Um, and I can just tell you the profound effect all you educators have. I can remember Mrs. Olson, Henderson, Polinas, Anfinson, Martin, and Young for my K-12 teachers. The college teachers blur a little bit, but <laughs> profound foundation they lay for us. And I was the admissions chair at Annapolis, and we would read what these teachers wrote. So the question, though, is for all those millions of kids, and in North Dakota, the um, the adults now that have passed this chance, they're now, you know, kind of maybe misprepared for the future. Any thoughts from the people here on how we can get those adults? Uh, and our state board, one of our members is here, has now set a higher goal for attainment, up to 65, moving to 70. Any thoughts on all the stuff you said here that you could say for adult learners who are already out there, even past college age now, who feel in some ways like I'm not college material, which is so damaging, right? Um, any thoughts on some things you've seen across the country here that we might be able to take in higher ed, um, you know, just to ruminate on a little bit, on how to bring them back in and benefit from some of the stuff you've said here? Hi, I'm Marcus, and I'm a recovering university administrator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the goals that were put forth for college credentials a few years ago really helped spur a lot of innovations in, in jurisdictions where they looked in their, their rosters of students who had, say, 60, even 80 credits but never earned a credential. And the more proactive institutions as well as state systems reached back out to those people. They used DMV records to find them and send them direct mail to say, come back to us. We will clear the glide path so that you can come back in, remove the red tape, adopt other credits from other institutions to help them get that over the hump. But it took an effort on the part of the states to collaborate with the other data systems as well as the institutions to say, we're still going to maintain our, our uh, commitment to quality, but we can remove some of this red tape nonsense and help these folks come back and earn the credentials so they can boost their game in our workforce uh, with their new credentials. Um, so if that's kind of on the credit recovery side of the equation, I think the other side of the equation is how do you have learning experiences that really connect you to the work of the future? And so there I'm linking back to what Ken was just saying um, in terms of the rich questions that North Dakotans need to answer at different levels of grain in the state, whether those are community questions, specific business questions, those are design challenges that can be scaffolded to bring all kinds of people together. And they're actually, for innovation challenges, they are best done with wide diversity of participants in any team. And so that person who isn't the college graduate is going to bring something really valuable. The, co the kids that are in college that are part of it are going to learn something from them that's different from what they're offering. And that's going to make for a very rich, that's what we seek when we're putting together innovation teams, is that kind of diversity. And so I think that's a, 
really a design around how to make those invitations and to create those platforms. And I don't mean that in a technical sense. That could be a community center, that can be at the university, that can be in business, that could be at a library, lots of different places. It can be online um, where folks can come together to work on those kinds of challenges. Yeah, I love the question. And, and uh, you know, the community college system in our country is one of our most powerful resources. And I think we can make the most of that. And, and one of the things I get excited about is when we rethink how that experience might work so that instead of it being two years, we can break it into shorter term, more immersive experiences. I'm involved with a group in New York that it's three month immersion in coding. And people who don't know anything about coding on the back end come out and they get great, 98% get jobs, they pay really well. But if you have a work environment where things are changing rapidly, 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 we need to have an education environment that sort of is similarly matched in terms of duration. And so an example I use is today, this will sound crazy, but world-class oncologist now refer to Watson to diagnose cancer patients. So if you spend 12 years to get a degree and be, you're, you're now a great oncologist, that job is on the chopping block. Sorry, I hope nobody here's an oncologist, but, you know, but, but if, if something that high skilled is, is on its way out, then, then we, we can't keep putting people through that long a period to get a job that turns out not to be there. And that's where, with the community college, with more practical, more applied faculty, with more focus on real work connections, with more direct connections to the workforce, because if you're 40 years old and your job's a dead end and it's going to go away, taking two years off to get something else with a family to support is very difficult. What I think employers should be doing is looking at these jobs that they say, this isn't a long-term situation, can I send my workers now to a three-month immersion so that instead of being replaced by a robot, they can be designing or, or running the robots? And so I think you're, and you're providing a lot of vision on that front, I know. So, and, and just to uh, add to that, um, the community colleges are doing a fabulous job around the country focused on their version of a profile of a graduate that is very student and industry responsive in their community. And what I would do with the Board of Regents, if I were in the Board of Regents, I would study uh, the half a dozen best community colleges in the country that have created a profile of a graduate for their students and that that would so is something that uh, those, those I, I agree completely with the practical experiences, but I also think you got to get better, at the, as good as the best community colleges, at actually teaching collaboration and teaching effective communication and teaching entrepreneurship. So I would look at what are the best examples. You may have some of them in North Dakota, but if you don't, I would be studying those best practices from around the country. We close with some next steps. Yeah. 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 So if we, if any, we are at our time. So any closing thoughts or remarks that any of you would like to make after spending time together? So I'll just I'll turn it over. I'll go last. Go down this way. Okay. okay. So I, I can't help but uh, just say because a few of you, I missed a few of you. Um, you know, my, one of my, first of all, I'm very energized and very excited about having been here and. Um, I'm very much looking forward to my fourth visit to North Dakota. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm in. But um, I do hope that there's some districts here. We have four districts right now, um, uh, Richland, Partial, West Fargo, and Fargo, that are members of Ed Leader 21. And I hope uh, that some of you are, who are here um, will think that your district should be part of our national community working on 21st century education and a profile of a graduate. If you want to email me at kkay at edleader21.com, um, if you want to give me your card and put tour on it, we'll arrange for an online tour for you and your leadership team. I guess what I would say is, is that the states that have really moved in this direction aggressively end up having 10 or 12 districts that not only are part of the national conversation, but end up working together on this work collaboratively. And I think given where you're headed, we'd love to have 10 to 12 districts in North Dakota as part of Ed Leader 21. So I hope some of you will consider joining. Congratulations to you both, and congratulations to all educators in the state of North Dakota for the environment that you get to operate in. We're proud to be partners with you. Yeah, I'll just add my thanks and gratitude for being a part of the day to the governor's office and the superintendent. Um, and think about a first action that you want to take. Perhaps it is to shadow a student. Perhaps it is some other small, quick win to give yourself a new view on uh, what is happening in your school or in your community to take forward as you continue to innovate.
So um, I'm going to put a challenge out here. Um, and, and so this has been a great day. You know, it is fabulous to have you here. There are a lot of people who aren't here. We have to get them on our side. But changing education is like getting a flywheel to start rotating. And the flywheel is moving in North Dakota. And so if we leave here and just assume it's going to keep going, it will slow down and stop again. And getting it going the next time will be that much harder because we'll all say, well, we tried it once. And so, so to me, what, <laughs> what, what, what I'd love to do, and I'm going to put this, you've got some working sessions, and then um, we've got a wrap-up session. But, but could we do this again next year? Could we, during this upcoming school year, put in front, we've got a bunch of things here, resources we can make available to you, get your ideas for great resources, but um, there was a session earlier, your session, I forget, she was really articulate, Molly? Molly. Yeah, Molly, who, who said, you're like, yes, great. You know, like, go up the high dive, but the people that aren't here may not want to go up the, the high dive. Can we get every school in North Dakota to agree to at least put their foot in the water? Can we put it in front of the, the, the collective body of educators in North Dakota? These are 10 things to think about doing, simple things. You know, show my film at your school. Try shadowing a student. You know, do, do an exercise where you profile a graduate. Understand more what Marcus is doing and look at your professional development offerings, which are great. And, and sort of say, we're going to get a map up of North Dakota. We're going to show what's happening across the state. Come back again next year and share those success stories. Take that flywheel that's starting to move and accelerate it, and then turn this into an annual event that we actually show, boom, year after year after year, there is great progress because it will take a while. I know that. I understand that. But, but on the other hand, I have seen entire districts in two to three years go from very traditional to unbelievably great places where you can't find one single kid in those schools that's bored. And so you guys could do that. And as I said, I'm, I'll come back any, any time you call me to do it, but it really is something I think on your drive home, I'd ask you to sort of reflect on, or if you're going somebody else to think about, how hard am I willing to fight? How much effort will I put in to work for the futures of our kids? Because you're speaking for 100,000 kids, but you're speaking for 75 million. So I really appreciate your guys' dedication, your attention to this, and it's just a very inspiring place to come. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ken, Marcus, Susie, Ted, Superintendent Basler, thank you so much.